Welcome to Meddling with Nature, a podcast about life, death, and the process that transforms one to another. We are taxidermists, printmakers, performers, collectors, advocates, and anything we need to be in order to carry out the work we do as naturalists. Each week, Mike Price, Karina Young, Nate Wessel, Jeremy Johnson, and guests will explore topics ranging from ethics to arachnophobia, bone cleaning to stuffing tigers. So go on, love, put the kettle on and give us a listen, won't you? something that I was going to talk about that was better than the thing that we originally were going to talk about to start this off, but all of a sudden now I can't remember, and I really wish I would have written it down. But, since I can't remember what that thing was, let's just talk about um, Takusubo cardiomyopathy. I'm sorry, that sounds like something I would get at my doctor's Japanese restaurant. That's very funny, because you could get it and go to the doctor, but... Part of it you could also get at a Japanese restaurant. (laughs) Well, tell me more. (laughs) So, uh, is that when you have eels in your heart? Kind of, yeah. Like, but the eels are sadness, Mm -hmm. and they. So basically, this. uh, What's the squirming? It's the the sadness. Squirming. Oh my God! It's atrial fibrillation or ventricle fibrillation. It's just your heart being like a bag of worms. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. He said worms, and you're talking about sushi. Okay, carry on. So, taco subo cardiomyopathy. Taco subo cardiomyopathy. Let's taco say it again. Su- taco subo. Taco subo. Taco subo cardiomyopathy. Taco subo cardiomyopathy. I like it. Okay. So, taco subo cardiomyopathy mm-hmm. is commonly called broken heart syndrome, and so what broken heart syndrome is is basically like um, it's caused by stress. And so, if you have someone who dies near you, um, and this has, like, been proven, there are cases of it, um, if someone dies and it affects you really intensely, you can have a heart attack, Mm -hmm. and when you go to the doctor, they'll do the tests on you, and it'll look like you had a heart attack, except Mm -hmm. there won't be any blockages in your heart, and so it's obvious that you didn't actually have a heart attack. And so... It's like a stress attack? So it's like a... Kind of like a... But it affects the heart. But it affects the heart, and the reason why... It has this name, Takusubo cardiomyopathy, is because there's like a part of your heart, the left ventricle, like, ex- like uh, expands. Think of it like a taco. No, no, no it, like it has nothing to do with tacos. Okay, just wanted to make yeah. sure everybody knew that before we got too far into this. Because <laughs> everybody's just thinking, it's like, it's something to do with a taco, right? It has yeah. nothing to do with a taco. So the Takusubo. <laughs> Is a bowl that you oh. use to catch squid uh-huh. in Japan, I guess. I'm gonna assume it used to catch squid, uh-huh. and so your left ventricle enlarges. And when they look at the images of your heart, I guess that it looks like one of these taco soup mm-hmm. bowls. And they think, which there's not a whole lot of research into this particular syndrome, so they're not really absolutely certain what causes it. But they think that it's caused by an influx of adrenaline into your heart, you know, as a response mm-hmm. to the stress. And it causes your heart to, basically it causes your left ventricle to stop working properly, but mm-hmm. the rest of your heart continues to work, and so it expands it. And the interesting thing about it is that it really does look like a heart attack. And so it's kind of like your body mm-hmm. telling you that, to slow down. And, you know... It well, is is that what a heart attack is, or is it like telling you to go die now? A heart attack is like, seriously, get, a mechanic, down, get a mechanic out here, a <laughs> well, You know, it's like, it's like an in, intense version of, you know, It's like a body panic intervention. Attack. Yeah, you know, it's your body telling you, you know, you're really sad, just chill out. So do we have uh, examples of this, of just people who are just sad? Like, we're looking at, like, this this idea that it happens when a, a loved one is gone or, you know, there's some sort of tragedy that happens to someone you care about. I mean, does this also happen when you lose the lottery or no, I every think, week? 
There's from days. from what I was reading, it typically happens when something really dramatic happens really suddenly. Mm-hmm. Um, there there was a case of it where a woman on her 60th birthday they like gave her a surprise party and she was so surprised that it gave her <sighs> Takasubo cardiomyopathy, uh, which mm. is real sad. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of picturing like yeah. she walked in and like the yeah. the furnace had gone wrong and the entire surprise party was dead from carbon <laughs> monoxide. <laughs> That's a good one. Man, they're all cherry red faces. The candles yeah. on the cake had gone out. It's <laughs> <laughs> awful. Um, but typically it's it's something that is gonna affect you when, you know, you have a sudden a sudden sadness overcome you. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens more to women. You know, because apparently men don't give a shit mm-hmm. about anything. Um but that leads us into like this idea that that your how am I segueing this in here? Well, why are we even talking about this this broken heart syndrome? Well, why are we why why are you 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 torturing our hearts to think about these loved ones <laughs> who are passing away? Why are you retching the beating pumpy bits of my soul out and making me think about these terrible things? Because I, I want you to think about the effect that your heart has on the rest of your oh, body. My heart reaches out to the rest of my body. Right, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Is, <laughs> is the connection that our heart has to the rest of our body, and the fact that you know, in this example, you know, the the brain isn't stopping this from happening, even though, you know, it would be easy for the brain. Well, it's ridiculous. Why wouldn't the brain? Why wouldn't the brain just say stop it? Stop it, heart. Seriously. Yeah, why not? Or for a heart attack, either. Well, that's a little different, though, too, because you've got blood blockage and all this other kind of stuff. Something. I mean, but this would be something that would be simple for the heart to block. Mm -hmm. To say, you know, stop sending so much adrenaline that way. Stop being such a little bitch. So why, 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 what is the difference between thinking with our heads and thinking with our, I mean, uh, hearts? (laughs) Oh, wait, we, we never introduced ourselves. Hi, I'm Nate. Don't pay attention to that one. I'm Karina. I'm Jeremy Johnson. Today we're talking about all the different places in our bodies that we can actually have a brain outside of our head. Cool. Um, so, like, one of them would be the heart. And, mm-hmm. um, there's there's another theory that, you know, our, our digestive system has a brain as well. Hey, what are these theories? <laughs> what is this discussion of theory? That um, mean? Well, why, you know, why do we think that... One of the ventricles of our heart all of a sudden came came up with uh, with going to college, well, getting an advanced degree. Well, we're not, you know, getting all crazy or anything. It's, you know... But my heart wanted some... me to. Why are you baiting me in such a weird way? Because I'm having fun. <laughs> <laughs> You're not being awful at all, Jim. <laughs> Don't mm-hmm. talk about your heart because, college. Because, because Nate says I lecture too much, so I'm trying not to do any of that. Just well, shut up, then. Let her talk. <laughs> you just keep going, sister. This idea that our heart is, you know, that it has emotion and that our heart has some control over the things that are going on in our body mm-hmm. it is not a new idea. Um, you know, they're starting to find, like, research is starting to, you know, show things that that are saying that that is true now, Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a new idea. Nate, come over here and tell us about Aristotle. Tell me about Aristotle and Plato. Right, so there's like a lot of history about talking about sort of the soul of man being in his chest instead of in his head, and this is before we had like science as we know it now, or, or systematic anatomy. Um, it's all very poetic for the most part but it seems like perhaps there's a tiny bit of truth to it, um, which is maybe fortuitous for some of the ancient poets. Um, but maybe they knew something. I'm not ready to buy that yet, but, um, yeah, there's, there's been a collision of poetry and science. Well, I think when we're looking at medical history, we see it as something that has a lot of, a lot of entwinement with, with, Sociology, philosoph- you know, philosophy, and anthropology, and all these sorts of things. But it also, we don't necessarily recognize it when 
it's occurring in our own modern time. Like, I think we're thinking about things such as the mechanistic view of the human body. That it's a series of machines. It's, you know, the post-industrial age. And, uh, and so is it maybe that we're starting to look at some of these other interactions because machines are not so much the hottest shit right now, but going into more um, invisible technologies? You mean not the hottest shit? Well, it's just not. I mean, like, when we're thinking about... We're, we're moving away from fantasizing about hardware and more to fantasizing <coughs> about software, perhaps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's still a machine. What is that? What do you it's, mean? It's a logical machine. What is? Software. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I don't think that that's, that's not what I'm talking okay. about. I mean, when we're talking about industry and, and these, these physical components, like, we've... It changes, I think, in modern times because we're looking at things that we can't necessarily see. So we're affording other parts of... We're, we're looking at smaller machines rather than larger constructs. So the heart is a pump. And we've been used to that for a while. Well, I was going to say that it makes sense to me that they felt like the soul and that there was things happening in your chest as compared to in your brain because when I'm happy and when I'm sad, like, you can feel it in mm-hmm. your abdomen. Like you can, like, I usually, I have never thought, oh my God, my brain is so happy. <laughs> 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 or, oh... You know, you're making me so sad in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, my head doesn't hurt when I'm sad. It hurts when I'm stressed sometimes, but it doesn't hurt when I'm sad. Mm-hmm. But when I'm sad, I feel it There's, like, a in location chest. in the chest, but how do you know it's not in your lungs? Well, I don't know. Or sadness could be in your small intestine. It Either. definitely could be in my small intestine. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to my small intestine. <laughs> we're going to talk about my small intestine. Well, I think because we're also talking about beats, we're talking about um, the, the effects that adrenaline might have, or, uh, you know, like, but, but I think that's, that's, a, that's a good question. What is it that makes you think it's about the heart when you're saying my heart aches? What does that mean? It's not, I, I can't it's just, I can't, I don't think it's just a, a poetic thought. What Why more, is it so is pervasive? It? Well, I'll explain it. Well, that would take us to the end. What? Okay, well, I don't understand. <laughs> um, so, I mean, now we're talking so about... When did we go from from feeling... When did our ancestors go from saying, you know, that our soul is in our heart? You know, I mean, this went on for years and years and years. They were talking about, like, that things were happening in your heart and they weren't really paying that much attention to your brain. They considered it cooling. Your brain was an air conditioner. Which is weird. <laughs> Don't know how that even worked. <laughs> but <laughs> made no sense to me. But, you know, there was a point where it shifted. Mm-hmm. When did that happen, Jeremy? I want, I want you to lecture. <laughs> You're just tired. <laughs> I'm not tired. I'm wide awake. Jeremy, <laughs> um, help. Well, when did it change? I think. Why did it change? How did it change? I mean, because that's a lot of there time was... that they spent making this decision. Yeah. Uh, over a thousand years, I suppose. You know, 1,500 years, good mm-hmm. amount of time. Yeah. Um, and even then, the philosophy of the body was, was difficult. And then, once you had a time in which people could start to think about it a little bit more logically, I suppose, uh, religious beliefs really did a number on upholding that, that kind of sacred heart mentality, that idea. But then there came a time, I, I think, you know, with the Enlightenment and, and just the advancement after the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, all that good stuff, getting into... Um, practice of, of, of modern science and experimentation mm-hmm. and opening people up and seeing how they worked and uh, vivisection. Uh, William Harvey is most noted for uh, his exploration of the heart and how it worked. And that was when we decided to start calling it circulation. circulation. But at the same time, you've got you know a philosopher such as 
Descartes, um, who's espousing a very mechanistic view of the world itself. This is, you know, right right before when we're getting into revol- industrial revolutionary times, and so I think that that's that's what we see even currently today. We're starting to come out of that a little bit. Like that's why I'm talking about this this idea of mechanism is 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 an older idea of mechanism, not uh, uh, not a a teeny tiny quantum one when we're looking at more physics to, to help us well of course physics is involved with both sides of it but but that mechanistic view of the heart turned it into a direct pump and I think separated literature philosophy uh, poetry yeah. and physics yeah so so Harvey changed the way that we thought about the heart and so now we're coming <clears throat> back to to this point of you know, we've believed in what Harvey told us for so long. I mean, it took a while for people, I think, to start believing him. Yeah. About, like, what was really going on. Well, the good thing, too, is that, that he did have a lot of, of support, even in his own life. You know, a lot of a lot of scientists can't really say that. You know, they yeah. have to wait until they've been dead for a very long time to get any sort of appreciation for anything they've done. Right. Or they'll get house arrested, like Galileo, who apparently met William Harvey once. <laughs> When William Harvey was traveling with with a king whose name I can't remember, yeah. King James, maybe. Yeah. Uh, they were traveling around. They were. William Harvey apparently was a world traveler. There was a lot of things that we did not know about William Harvey mm-hmm. until I did a little research on him today, aka read the Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> because as much as I've read about William Harvey, it has never occurred to me to actually go and read the yeah, Wikipedia. Yeah, well, you've page. read his words. You've read his book. You know, <laughs> I mean that that's a little bit more. There were a few things that he didn't mention in that book. No, there were, it for was example, not a biography. <laughs> for example, that he may or may not have met Galileo, mm-hmm. um, and also that he was an anti-witch hunter. Or he was a witch debunker. A witch debunker. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like a thing. A modern day pen and teller. A modern day <laughs> uh, was amazing. Amazing who? What was his name? Amazing. Uh, Randy? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. The Amazing about. Randy, yeah. Amazing Randy? Yeah, give a, a, a shit ton of money to anybody who can prove that uh, that psychic or kinetic, uh, to, you know, whatever abilities exist. Is this exist. a real person? Yeah, this is a real person, yeah. You're not just making this up? No. There's somebody who goes around and calls themselves Amazing Randy. Oh, he's a magician, yeah. Amazing Randy? It's an old magician. Randy? Yeah. <laughs> yes. There is an Amazing Randy. Couldn't you come up with a better name than that? Amazing Randy? Randolph? That would be better. Yeah. For real. So anyway... His, his given name was Adolf Hitler. Then he should have said the Amazing Al. <laughs> <laughs> that, was already, that was already taken up by Alf. So? So, William Harvey used to go hunting witches. He was like on a... Um, what do they call him? Like a tribunal kind of oh, thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he... He was on the board of witch hunters. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be on the board of witch hunters. <laughs> this, this begins the 14th annual meeting of the Witch Hunters Association. <laughs> We'd like to talk about Sally. <laughs> so apparently, he he was, you know, who knows why he was taking this on. Maybe he decided, you know what, I am going to be a witch hunter debunker. Uh, in order to save all these young women, which apparently all of them were acquitted that he yeah. had a dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's one particular story involving a frog. I think it was a toad. A was toad. It a toad? Tell me. Was it a frog? Tell me about this I think toad. It was a toad. So he went over to this lady's house, and they thought she was a witch, and so he walked up and knocked on the door, and she answered the door, and he said, Dear lady, I am Sir William Harvey. Wizard Sir William Harvey. <laughs> he said wizard. <laughs> so he told her that he was a wizard and that he was there to test her witchiness. Mm-hmm. And On so, a scale of one to ten, how witchy are you, baby? <laughs> and she was like, oh, I'm about a ten. Mm-hmm. And he was like, prove it. And she summoned a toad. Like, she called for a toad and a toad came hopping in the room and he was like, that's real impressive. Now go get me a sandwich. And so he sent her away to, like, go get him a sandwich. She went down to the subway. <laughs> <laughs> she had him a cold cut trio. 
all turkey based products, that's not a myth. Um, <laughs> she gets her cold cut. So when and she, she does not buy the medium drink and the chips. Right, because no. he didn't ask for all uh-uh. that. I mean, they had beer there. I mean, yeah. obviously, she was a witch. She had some mead. Yeah. And so, when she comes back, he's sitting at the kitchen table dissecting a toad. So he cut her toad open, which I'm sure she was really pissed off about this, because if I trained a toad to come when I called <laughs> I know, it... I know. And I walked in and somebody, like, had it, like... Slayed out open. and pins and, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like... Just, like, looks up at you, like, oh, hey, did you get the sandwich? Did you make sure you got extra mayo? <laughs> did you toast it? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted the flatbread. And so she got real mad, and then he explained to her what the reason was, and he says, well, I'm here, I'm actually not a wizard, surprise, surprise, I'm actually a witch hunter debunker, and... <laughs> I'm here to prove that you are not a witch. And it's great that you're not, because this means I don't have to shackle you to the stovepipe while I call actual witch hunters out. Because that gets real awkward. Burn you at the stake. Yeah. So do you want that? Or do you want me to cut your toad open and prove that it's not a magical toad? So William Harvey was kind of into vivisection. Sadly, this is really the only way that you could see hearts move yeah. um, at the time. And so I mean it's safe to say that he went around debunking witches that purported to have fantastic animals so they could send them out to Subway, get sandwiches, and he could vivisect them. I mean, that's a pretty safe conclusion, right? I mean, it's That's how he did his research. like that's yeah. about right. In the Lord's name, too, yeah. so it was okay. Yeah. But if you ever see a picture of William Harvey, he kind of looks like a witch hunter debunker. Yeah. Hmm. So, he writes... This uh, this little treatise. It's it's not a very long thing. It's you know on the uh, um, the the circulation of animals, um, the modus corda. What? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, the we get them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. about it. Yeah. No, that's good enough. The modus corda. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't put it in my notes, so. Yeah, we don't have notes. The notes that are right on the back of my hand. Yeah, that's the front of your hand. <laughs> Radio. <laughs> um, yeah, so so it's it's not that big, but it's 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 fascinating because it is really the first time in which we're looking at someone describe circulation as a process. And if you're curious, I do believe that it is available for free on Google Play. Yeah, and it's like three bucks you can get it from Amazon. Yeah, it's so a paper copy. Read it for the first time, really nice. and it is very conversational. You know, this is before scientific books were really getting into the third person and the journal article was just like snobbery and idiocy yeah. and they were also a lot of times kind of very foolish but and it was very nice he started the whole thing with a with a preface where he addressed the king mm-hmm. and compared the king to the heart of the nation yeah and which you know is very interesting that he goes on to write to write this whole story about how the heart is not the seat of the soul mm mm-hmm. It's there to pump blood to the rest of your body. Mm-hmm. It's there to pump blood to your brain and the, everything else. That it's not something that's the seed of the soul. Right. But he's comparing it to a sovereign power. Right. And, you know, it is very flowery, the way that he actually describes that. Um, but it, it is also being very, very careful. You know, it uh, Because he really thought that he would have witch hunters after his debunking ass. Yeah. He really did. Mm-hmm. And to his surprise, in a, in a lot of ways, there wasn't that kind of pushback when he was talking about this idea of circulation. I mean, okay, so so what was it before? I mean, this is a relatively short podcast, so we can't really get into it that much, but the, the theory of the four humors um, is, is basically stating that... Uh, Which was Galen. Galen and you know and, and really you know Hippocrates too like yeah. this is this is a, a yeah. long standing yeah. sort of thing. Well, long story short, it's a bunch of misguided, crazy anatomy that is infused with spirituality that creates a system that allows the body to live. But the thing was is that the, 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 the blood was something that washed the tissues. It was not. It was not something they didn't understand capillaries, and neither, neither did William Harvey. He didn't get the transfer between the venous and the um, and and the arterial system, uh, or you know, just those types of circulation. He knew that it happened, but was basically predicting that smallest branch, which needs some pretty high magnification to enable to do to be able to do that. Um, 
But the, 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 this was blood that was circulating and not just being created and washing tissues. Wasn't Harvey... Didn't Harvey do something... Um, something where he, like, proved... Because I guess that, like, the whole Galenic model of the body and, like, yeah. the way that blood was produced and that... That the all liver, liver, business, liver yeah. like created all the fluids or something like that, and that they went through the heart and then they weren't reused or something. And right, and that's one of the things that he was calculating. Like, like, yeah. uh. like <laughs> in order for that to work, like not even. Yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> and if if God so created an animal that required this, then God needs to be called into the office. <laughs> <laughs> this is just not correct. Right. Uh, and yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, like, also looking at some of our older things, you know, like, uh, like, why are arteries called arteries? Because the roots, you know, like, of, of art, the artery meaning air, um, because they never really found anything during dissections in arteries, but they always did it in veins. And a lot of the reason is, you know, just the, the different methods of the, what these two vasculatures are supposed to carry: one a high pressure system, one a low pressure system. And this is where we get into this idea of the heart. That we'll try and get to quickly. It's, I guess, the anatomical part. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we know now. Um, so the heart is itself two systems that work in tandem with each other that are synchronized by a pacemaker, which is the sinoatrial node, um, and that is a nervous system that excites electrical. Um, uh, I don't want to say convulsion, contraction of myocardial tissue. So there's three types of muscle tissue in the human body, three major groups. You got your skeletal muscle, you got your smooth muscle, that's like your guts and things that do that, you know, like uh, and then and then you've got and skeletal is like your arms, the the, the ones that you're most familiar with, mm-hmm. the lever system. Um, and then you have myocardial muscle, you cardiac have smooth muscle. muscle. Where's the smooth muscle? I don't forget to tell me smooth muscle. Oh yeah, well it's your gut. It's like yeah. it's like it's like uh, the uh, the the autonomic areas of your your intestine, the, the the stuff that is muscle tissue, but has its own kind of smooth contraction that is not for moving great things, but for moving small things continuously. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? Because yeah. I mean, I mean, like I when we're looking at the gut muscle works. Yeah, it's it's like the I mean, yeah. Cause cause we've got a lot of really teeny tiny muscles all over you. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's yeah. it's it's really about the way the fibers are arranged. Mm-hmm. Um, so skeletal muscle is most similar to myocardial muscle. Myocardial muscle basically is skeletal, so we could really say there's only two. But the interesting thing about myocardial muscle, so my, myocardial muscle is a type of skeletal muscle, but it is arranged very differently. Uh, there's two major things that make it very different. One is that it, it, it is spherical in nature. It's, it's coiled, right? Whereas... Um, when you're looking at skeletal muscle, it, it, you get really, really close into it. It's like a bunch of ratchets that are ratcheting up on themselves. Um, but, but what's going on with with myocardial muscle is the same sort of thing, but it's coiled in on itself. So it's very, very springy, okay? Um, and it's also really, really imbued with nervous tissue. In a lot of ways, it is nervous tissue. So it has what's called inherent rhythmicity. So what you can do is you can... Uh, you can take, you can take a heart right out of a dog, right out. You know, as long as it's really fresh, and it's really fresh, like as in you can kill a dog. You can kill a dog. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> I, when you murder a dog, <laughs> um, you're gonna want to murder it by cutting its chest open. Yes. That's that's the so preferred. We don't recommend the, the that. Most humane kids. way to murder a dog is to cut its chest open, immediately grab its heart, and and rip, and it, put, out. rip it out and put it on a table. And you will notice something fascinating. Which we don't recommend that you do this. No, we have computer did, programs for this now. Yeah. If you did, yeah. In the Sims game, you're gonna get a get. You're gonna go and get you a dog. You get go, in Minecraft. In Minecraft, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna tame yourself a wolf. Yeah. And then you're going to slice its chest open, rip its heart out, yes, and throw it on a table. And what are we going to observe? What do you think is going to happen? It's going to keep beating. It's going to keep beating. Myocardial tissue has inherent rhythmicity. So that means that if the brain is in this... Also, you can have brain death and the heart still beats. Why the hell is that? Who knows? Because, well, because of machines. Inherent rhythmicity of, of cardiac muscle is very slow. It's not enough to, uh, to pump blood through the body. 
but it is continually pumping. It's it, well, it's continually contracting on its own accord. It has its own memory. Mm-hmm. Um, not to be confused with like hippocampus and all that other sort of stuff. It, it has its own function, uh, which is repeated. So that's great. But now we need to make sure that the heart is actually beating to the point in which we'll keep you alive. And so this is where the sinoatrial node comes in. This is where the brain and the heart have their love affair of, of talking to each other a little bit. So the sinoatrial node is a thing that, that uh, literally whips the heart into a faster beat per minute. Say literally? Yeah. Literally. Literally whips. Yeah, it's got a whip. It's also wearing... I guess it doesn't literally... ...assless chaps. <laughs> it does not really <laughs> literally whip anything, I suppose. It literally... Let me, let me redo that. Is this a pet peeve I online? want you to use literally. <laughs> I'm not using literally. I will use literally, but I'm not going to use whip. Yeah, don't use whip. Like, make literally work in the sentence. Okay. I'll give you a minute. The sentence is literally being restated. Okay, <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Three, two, one... So the sinoatrial node literally electrocutes, <laughs> electrocutes the rest of the heart to pump it at a higher rate. So the sinoatrial node literally electrocutes, electrocutes the rest of the heart. <laughs> in order to, in order to keep the beast permitted that you actually need to, to live. And, and, uh, you know, like how that sinoatrial node is, is, uh, told what to do. Well, this is the wonderful conversation between the heart and the brain and all that other sort of how stuff. How does that conversation happen? Well, it's through the nervous system. Oh, the nervous system. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, oh, I love the nervous system. Do you know what the nervous system is? Yeah. Tell me about the nervous system. It's a collection of neurons and neurotransmitters and Electricity. So this like, is how the brain tells the rest of the body to do everything, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's it basically, you know, you got your central nervous system, which is like your brain and your spine. CNS. CNS. Mm-hmm. And then you got your peripheral nervous system, which is. You're just working off the gut, so like F O X. No. no, peripheral. No, the peripheral oh, is. Damn it, I was waiting for this. Geez, you need to calm down. The peripheral is all this other shit. I know, I was really waiting for that. I know, joke. I was getting to it. Okay, like I'm going to get there. Okay, so we've got the CNS. <laughs> And then there's also the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral system, okay, what does that do? Um, that is, that controls the rest of your body, basically, like, you know, everything, it goes off of. Off so, are these, these like, uh, when we're looking at uh, not, you know, autonomic and, uh, you know, like, like uh, the self-naming sort of things, the things that do them their own bullshit, and then we've got, like, the nervous system that is um, sensory, where you're feeling things, and telling you when to move your hand from a stove. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then you've got this other thing going on in your gut, mm-hmm. which is, like, a whole other type of nervous system. Okay, what's that? It's called the enteric nervous system. Oh, Right. Well, we're going to take a little break and then get back into the enteric system, but I hear that we have a fun fact. Uh, I have, I have a, a, a fun fact and interjection. Uh-huh. A fun fact. Did you know that there are several species of turtles who breathe, <laughs> who can breathe water, breathe oxi- get oxygen from water through their cloaca? Oh, what's a cloaca? Um, it's like a combined anus, um, urethra, vagina. Did you know the turtles had those? <laughs> <laughs> it's where all the business happens. It's Wait, where the so poo goes. What, what about the males? Do they still have a penis? Well, they do for... for oh, but there's not a urethra. <laughs> and interjection is the following. Um, look it up, it's true. Um, or at least it is on the internet. So they breathe uh, through their butt? Yeah, so they like inhale and exhale like through their anus. Do they have other? Do they have and normal it goes into ones? these or is that sacs like... that like are all ribbed and have lots of surface area. Oh, ribbed. so they're so they're like they don't breathe through their nose. No, they they can do that. They um, can breathe through two separate spots on their body. Yeah. Man, that's witchcraft. And one of them is their anus. We need William Harvey over here. Because <laughs> we just found us a witch. All the turtles. <laughs> and, and when they when they discovered these, like the researchers like saw these turtles swimming with their cloacas like wide open and they're like, What the fuck are they doing? <laughs> they were going to some real interesting nightclubs. <laughs> you were trying to get a turtle all the way up in one of those things. Um, no, but I was reading I was reading this 
like quotation from one of the articles when they discovered these, and like these, you know, it quotes them as talking about like holding these turtles up to the light and like being able to like look like ten centimeters into their bodies, like up their assholes, what? because like the light was coming through their shells, so they could like the whole thing was like penetrated with light, and they look like up their assholes and be like, it's huge in there. So now they're gonna. <laughs> they were so excited. So I hear what they're going to do now is, is they're going to uh, genetically, you know, kind of figure some of this out genetically, and there'll be like little things they can give people for colonoscopies. Just inject them, and then their anuses just whip open to like, you said 10 centimeters to so 10 yeah. meters. And we like a good 10 said, meters <laughs> wide. <laughs> we thought we'd be embedding cell phones next. No. Nope. No. No, we're going to have lab technicians inside your colon to take pictures.